we have a group that's uh, co coordinating actions. So it feels really nice to uh, to be part of a, a better coordinated and, and increasingly impactful health community. And uh, last uh, cherry on top is that we have a health pavilion this year. We had a health pavilion last year as well for the first time, hosted by the World Health Organization and the, the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and this year we have one as well, and that sort of functions as a as a focal point or, or gathering point for the whole health community. Uh, I think there's almost something like 50 side events on climate and health happening there. And that's just in the health pavilion and there's loads happening elsewhere as well. Um, and this year the health pavilion is actually really um, impressive. They've built a, an art installation that is uh, made out of silver, but also used bits of wood. And it's a massive pair of lungs. So the whole pavilion is sort of taken in with two silver lungs. Uh, I'll try and send some pictures over next time. Um, and it, it really stands out. Yeah, it's really um, catchy. And I think they're hoping that that becomes sort of the image of COP. Like, you know, last year, the image was that globe hanging in the middle of the, the venue. And they're hoping that this year could be lungs uh, to make that connection directly with, with air pollution and our own health. Um, awesome. So yeah, very stoked. I'll, I'll make sure to bring some health community members along next time for their Yeah, impression. please do. Um, just on that, do you think, so we've got this, sorry, WHO is hosting this big pavilion and, um, you know, partnering with a whole bunch of orgs to like, you know, make thing, climate and health things happen at COP. Do you feel like from the times that you've gone over that the awareness around climate change and health is growing in the international space? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's quite impressive. And, and it's also nice to see that the definition of health is really being expanded. For example, this COP is very strongly focused on food um, and nutrition. And until recently, food in the UNFCCC context was understood as agriculture, so really just the production of food. And, and now that's really been expanded to include nutrition and understanding that well, food is supposed to sustain us and keep us healthy. So how do we expand that definition? And for example, WHO is working with the COP presidency, which is Egypt this year, and a bunch of other organizations to set up a, a food initiative. Um, and just, just, just one example of how health is really slowly creeping up in different um, areas really of the negotiations. And I think food is, is one really powerful example. Uh, but there's loads of others that, that really are not clearly defined. Uh, mental health, for example, is another one that really doesn't have a place yet at this, at this discussion um, and one that ideally in, in um, the future will. But it's interesting though, because I had a quick discussion with the, one of the Australian negotiators yesterday talking about climate and health, and he had never made the connection. And I could, I could literally see in his face that he was slowly oh oh i see yes climate and health are important so people understand once you start talking to them but they've never thought of that connection uh, and that was an Australian negotiator who as soon as i started talking about that he did understand that it's it's really not on their radar so there is a lot of advocacy uh, work to be done i think for the health community to to help people understand that, that the health lens really puts people first in these discussions and helps it move away from a very technocratic very technological focused discussion or energy focused discussion and make sure that we're talking about people in these discussions and so I see there's a lot of work to be done for us here um, yeah to negotiate I um find it so sad <laughs> that you were talking to a negotiator and they hadn't made that link yet so a really good note for you know you and I as as Kaha staff but all of us um who you know who may uh you know liaise with uh, people who make decisions, this link is not clear in everyone's mind um, and anything we can all do to raise that profile is still really sorely needed. Um, speaking about the Australian negotiators, Arthur, I wondered if you could maybe share a little bit about the Australian presence at COP. Um, if we've got Santos advertising all over our pavilion again this year or if we've improved since last year. Well, it, it was pretty hard to go backwards, so we definitely have improved. The, the pavilion looks really nice, so there's no no ads on it at all. Um, to be honest, we haven't really engaged much. I mean, it's just started, really. But the the difference between last year and and being able to to engage with the Australian delegation is quite enormous. They've reached out um, a lot in advance um, to everybody who was going. They've opened up their delegation to um, allow people who wouldn't have an organization to go with to go under the Australian delegation. And that's through a system called party overflow. So that means you're technically part of the Australian negotiation team, but you're not allowed to speak on their behalf. So that's their way to be able to open up um, the discussion to people who might not have an accredited organization. So CAHA is accredited under the UNFCCC, but loads of organizations are not. And so they can't come to the COP. Um, and so it's quite a nice move from the Australian delegation to open that, like, oh, provide access really through badges and also provide access through 
um, their thinking and their focus. So there's been a few calls before the COP and, and um, we'll have a couple of um, stakeholder engagement meetings with them during the COP and they're very approachable this time around. So that's, that's a great improvement. And of course, that's quite necessary if they do wanna host COP31. Um, I, I can notice though that the, the delegation was sort of expected to get a bit of a, a home run coming here, like, oh, great, Australia is back kind of vibe. But um, I think that has backfired slightly. Um, and because they're trying to get a bit more in the spotlight with hosting a COP, actually a lot of tricky questions are coming their way. Why are you expanding fossil fuels? You're still one of the largest fossil fuel exporters in the world. Why are you so active in setting up a global carbon market? So one of the lead negotiators or co-facilitators they're called of the, the negotiations around carbon markets is an Australian. So there's a clear sort of vested interest there. Australia wants to make sure that there's a really good offsetting scheme set up. So Australia has not suddenly gone from the bad guy to the good guy. There, there's still a lot of work to be done. And, and in a space like this, there is a lot of scrutiny on them. Um, so I, I think they've, they've received a bit of reality check is what is my sense. Um, that at home they're doing great work uh, domestically, but internationally they're still very far behind and they're not really providing the, the support and the, the, that they're required to deliver, really. Yeah. Um, can I ask you, I didn't, I didn't prep you for this one, so feel free to just fob me off, but speaking of another um, bad guy moving from a good guy, I'm wondering if there's been any chats about um, the shift from Brazil um, who have been a very strongly you know, big villain at COPs in the past. Um, what do you reckon? Any idea about how they're going to approach um, at this COP? Uh, sorry, I'm just moving. I realise just next to the smoking area, which is oh. not very healthy, is it? So no, no, I'm, right. I'm moving. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. And actually, um, with a few, I, I know a few of the Australian uh, Brazilian negotiators, and I've, I've bumped into a few. So you can sometimes you hear like clapping and lula lula. Like whenever you meet a, a, a Brazilian negotiator, there's a lot of cheering on, and uh, they're quite happy. The main issue is that um, uh, Lula, the Brazilian president, was elected really, really recently, and the negotiation team that is currently here uh, was put in place by Bolsonaro. So they're in a very tricky spot. They're very quiet. They don't really have a mandate to say anything. So in a way, it's Brazil's back, but the negotiation team here can't really say or do anything because they, they're sort of still following the policies and the, the, the targets from the previous government. Um, so yeah. they're very quiet. Um, they have not said much, but uh, today the leader summit is kicking off today and tomorrow. Um, and with that leader summit, they're hoping to have, I think almost a hundred leaders will be here. And I think Lula is one of them. So that might help. Sort of shape the direction and uh, I think there will be a strong sort of deforestation announcement from from Brazil um, so ending deforestation uh, and I, I, so I, I think there will be a clear sense of all Brazil's back but we're not getting that from the actual negotiators who are still who are bureaucrats uh, and, and we don't really know what yeah. they can or cannot say yet at this point. Thank you. Um, I'll finish with this one and then we'll open up for questions. Um, I see a few questions coming in, so we will definitely go to them. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the Leaders Summit. Uh, what are the expectations around it? What is it and, and what is it aiming to achieve or what's the purpose of it? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around um, if this is important to have right now, have all these leaders here because there's been a bit of pushback. Why are all these leaders coming here? We're here to uh, figure out the details. We're not really expecting a lot of new pledges or new announcements. So why are they here? Um, do they have a role? Um, so there's a bit of that, but at the same time, it, it is very powerful to bring a hundred leaders here and really have all the, the global attention focused on this because we're in a very rough spot where there's a lot to be negotiated. There's a lot of tricky issues where we're being hammered by many different uh, crises really. And just so bringing all these leaders together here really does help to get us out of that deadlock and, and, and build a bit of um, shared trust really and, and momentum again. So I, my expectation is that it will provide a, a, a sense of momentum to, uh, to the negotiations uh, and, and, and probably also a couple of announcements, but um, I'm, I, I'm not really on top of what those might be. And for example, on the Australian side, I'm, I assume that the, the fact that Australia has a new NDC and has a new global methane pledge will probably be highlighted. Um, but and I could also imagine a couple of countries who like do announcements. There's a few countries, for example, that might announce new NDCs. Um, I think Vietnam is one of them. Um, the EU might also announce that they're updating their NDC. So there's a few things like that that will just 
inject a bit of momentum in the, in the talks before we get down to the more boring nitty gritty of, of all the negotiations. Yeah, and just for people who might not be familiar, can you just define what an NDC is? Oh, sorry. Sorry, we <laughs> should have an ac acronym radar on, on this call. So NDCs are the, the National Climate Plans that countries put forward, and Australia put its National Climate Plan forward for relatively recently uh, to reduce emissions by 43% by 2030. Um, and the idea was that with this, since Glasgow, which was really an amb ambition summit, um, this particular summit was uh, an, is framed as an implementation summit. Like we've pledged all these great plans, now we have to get down to work, but there's still a massive gap. And so after Glasgow, uh, countries were sort of asked to submit a new NDC, like to close that gap between what we're doing and, and where the Paris Agreement wants us to go. Uh, and Australia was one of the few countries who did come up with a new NDC. Most countries didn't. Uh, we expect a few more to announce at the COP, but so it hasn't really worked. Glasgow was really sort of like, oh, that's all fletch new targets. And then by the time we come to Egypt, we can start thinking about how to implement them. Um, and that hasn't really worked out, but Australia has done it. So they, they'll probably get a, a bit of that on the back for that. Um, yeah. Awesome. All right, I'm going to move into questions. Um, and, and we were just talking about the leaders summit. So I'm going to start with Melissa's. Um, it's a good question. What is the significance of Prime Minister Albanese not attending? Um, obviously, when Scott's, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, I'll use his his full term, full name, uh, didn't attend last year, there was a big uproar. Uh, but then you've just said that there's some pushback at the conference about so many leaders attending. So what, what's your um, what's your take on um, Albanese not attending? It's a, yeah, again, it's a good question, and I'm not sure if I have the answer, but. Um... Like you said, there wasn't really a, a space for leaders generally, but then now that there's a hundred leaders coming and Australia is not one of them. And at the same time, Australia wants to be hosting COP31. That's that's just quite a strange um, look really. Um, so I haven't heard any sort of criticism, but um, it, it is a bit awkward. Um, and But I'm wondering if it has anything to do with, with parliament sitting in the first week as well, or with any sort of internal politics. So there might be really good reason, I, I don't know uh, of it. Um, and to be honest, there's a hundred other leaders here. Um, it's just a missed opportunity, I think, for Australia. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I, if I find well, any more, I don't more, I'll let you know, but it's yeah. not really come up with it. That's it. If others have questions that Arthur doesn't know the answer to, he will find them in his next two weeks and you can you can join us for our next, our next catch up on Thursday. All right, a couple other questions. Um, is WHO holding any particular forum? Uh, at COP24 and COP25, they, they held a full day on the weekend. Um, yeah. There's a very good question. Um, they are not this year. Um, so until recently they did, um, so they were part of the negotiations, but they did an outside conference on climate and health every year. Uh, that was a bit more accessible because it was outside of the conference, so anybody could join it. Uh, they're not doing one this year, but they will be doing one next year. So they've decided to move to doing one every second year. And it's also mainly because they've really increased their presence with inside of the COP. So it's a lot of work with their pavilion. They're, they're trying to have, they basically have back-to-back -back side events for two weeks. Um, and so there's a bit of a focus more on inside engagement and not so much on the outside, but next year there will be a pavilion and a conference on climate and health. And so it would be nice to figure out if by the time Australia hosts a COP that we can make sure that there's also um, a, a global conference on climate and health happening on the sidelines of COP. So that's a, a really good question to start thinking about already. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions here. I might ask the second one first. Uh, so paraphrasing, what influence do you think the global economic slowdown and the Russia-Ukraine crisis will have in terms of dominating the discussions? That's a very good questions. Um, I think people were a little bit afraid that Russia might derail the discussions, for example, that hasn't really happened. Russia has generally not been super active in the climate talks, which is maybe not surprising, but um, they're not very active. It is interesting, though, um, the opening plenary happened yesterday. So the official opening happened yesterday and Ukraine took the floor. Um, sorry. sorry, Ukraine took the floor uh, saying that actually we can't really update you this summit on progress on climate change. Uh, because half of our territory is being invaded and occupied. And it's a comment that they've made, I think, six or seven years in a row now since the invasion of Crimea. Every time there's a plenary, they, uh, they bring this up. Um, so it, it does come up. And I know in the intersessional, which was six months ago in, in Germany, which is sort of the 
in between sessions, which are a bit more technical, uh, Russia took the floor as well. And I think half of the room walked away. So I'm assuming we'll see more of that sort of dramatic uh, theater happening here as well, where if Russia takes the floor, people might just walk out. Um, but I, at this stage, I don't think it will completely derail the discussions, but it, it might. And there's a lot of things that could derail the discussion. So let's see where we end up. Yeah, um, a great question in from Sariako Stephen, who's uh, joining us from the Torres Strait. Uh, what does the UN decision for the Torres Strait 8 mean to the world? Have you heard any, any feedback on that from your international colleagues? That is, again, a really good question. And, and it's, it's the first day, so I, I don't feel like I'm, I have a good answer to that yet. I do know there's a lot of um, events planned around this as well. And we have uh, quite a few people from the, from the Torres Strait here who will be speaking. Um, so I, I, if you're okay with that, I'll, I'll take that question on notice and come back with, maybe I'll try and get somebody from Torres Strait to join a call as well. But I, I do know they have a lot of things planned. Um, and I think it feeds well into that whole um, sense of climate impacts are here are now um, and makes it very pressing and very real. Um, so I, it's, I think that's a really great one to come back to. Yeah, I do know that at least several, yeah, at least, I think it's at least three of the Torres Strait Aid are over in Egypt, perhaps more. So if we could get them to join us for a chat, we would absolutely love that. Um, is there a strong contingent from the First Nations people from the Amazon region? They, I haven't seen them yet. Uh, again, it's it's day, day one, really. Um, but last year, there was an incredible, massive um, delegation here. And I assume this year there will be as well. I haven't seen them yet. Uh, but last year there was, a, and I, I think this year as well, there was a, a First Nations pavilion. Um, and really, like it gave me shivers every time I walked past it because it was just these incredibly colorful, incredibly powerful group of people from all over the world. Um, taking up the space they deserve really at these pavilions. And um, they, they were also uh, part of quite a lot of the, the negotiations and made quite powerful statements that year. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll see a lot of that this year as well. Um, so that, I think that's, it's really great. And until COP26, that was not really the case. There were always representatives uh, of First Nations um, here, but their, their presence wasn't as felt as it is now. Um, and so it, it was very felt in COP26. It will, I'm sure, will be very present in COP27, but the big difference is now that the First Nations um, in Australia will also be very present. And I think last year they were very underrepresented. So I think it's quite nice that we can provide some Australian flavor to, to that presence this year as well. Thanks, Arthur. Um, last question. What does Kaha hope to achieve out of COP27? <laughs> A big question, and we can probably both comment. Um, but I might, I might uh, start with you, rather than what we hope to achieve, because I think what we hope to achieve is just like climate change being solved and like, you know, settle down. But yeah, what, what does um, this being a successful conference for you look like? Yeah, one step at a time, Remy. Uh, I don't think we'll solve all the world's problems this uh, conference, but um, it feels really good to be part of a big Australian delegation here. Uh, the health community is very, very present here as well. And it's, re it's pretty nice that Kaha can plug into that. And uh, it's really, one of the things I really like about this year is that the First Nations delegation uh, from Australia and Pacific is really, really big. Um, I really hope that I, I, our presence here can just support them as much as possible. Uh, there's a lot of incredible voices that we can be lifting up. Um, and with our experience with actually following the negotiations, there's also a lot of room for us to sort of mainstream the health argument for climate action in many of these discussions and negotiations. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I think the, the key point is that we can lift the voices of the most impacted uh, and disenfranchised up, um, and that we make sure that we uh, strengthen the health argument for climate action in all the different negotiation streams. Awesome. Um, yeah, all I would add is that, um, you know, some of the most important decisions in the world get made at these conferences and, uh, you know, if if we don't have people like you on the ground, uh, there's so much that we miss out on in that process and that, uh, you know, everyday people are not included on. I mean, I find it hard to follow COP and I'm deeply following climate policy and I, I care a lot and if I find it hard to follow, it's, it's really tough for the average people who this issue affects first and worst to follow. So... Um, thanks everyone for joining us at 6.30. I don't want to take up any more of Arthur's precious time overseas, but we are running these 
uh, on Thursday and uh, yeah, Thursday and then the next week and then the Monday, the week, Thursday, the week after. Sorry, that was a terrible thing, but it's too late and I have to go. Uh, but you'll all get reminder emails about them. Um, and feel free to invite invite anyone in your networks. Uh, they're totally welcome to come. Um, and yeah, send us, feel free to send us an email. I'll just chuck my email in the chat. If you want to get in touch with me for any reason, questions or feedback or, you know, complaints, whatever it is, I'm open to hearing it. So, um, yeah, we'll see you hopefully next Thursday. I mean, this Thursday, this Thursday the 10th. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks, Arthur. Cheers.